can you guys hear me? Okay, so sorry for all the delay. I guess it's a networking conference, so we're figuring out the basics. Um, so this is in continuation with the talk that Jamal gave, uh, which was the details on, uh, you know, the P4TC kernel framework that we are creating. Uh, of course, it's being created for using it in software as well as, um, you know, uh, offloading it to smart devices like smart next DPUs, IPUs and stuff. Um, so this workshop, the agenda looks something like this. We have um, test framework walkthrough from uh, various folks who are working on it. Then there's a kernel code walkthrough, which Jamal will shorten for us because he wasted our 30 minutes. So <laughs> and then there's introspection from Neha. There's compiler support from Bala and Soshuta. And then driver interface that Khalid and myself uh, will um, discuss about that. And that there are topics on program parser and conclusion. So that's our agenda. Um, how to contribute to P4TC, there is a mailing list. I'm sure Jamal has gone through it in his talk, but if it hasn't, I will put all the links here, which are not here yet. But yeah, there is a GitHub, there is a mailing list, there is a working group uh, that meets every two weeks, and there are notes from the last four or five months, so you guys can catch up on it. Um, status, uh, progress so far, software model um, is uh, looking good. Uh, the test framework is looking good. Compiler backend for generating P4TC scripts. Now this one is, um, uh, you know, the work that Intel team did. And we'll talk about different compiler backends for different targets and stuff. And the introspection work. Not started yet. Driver and offload hooks. Uh, and there are some opens on the parser. So that's the status. And I will then give it to the test framework team. Let me bring their presentation up. Um, give me a second. I, it will take me a minute to find. Do you, do you need something, Jamal? No, no, I, I, I'm not. It's supposed to be displaying here as well. And it's not coming up there. Okay, so. It's got a plugin for any people. I mean, you heard the HDMI, right? Okay, just give me a second, Jamal. I, I, I need to bring this presentation up. Okay, where is this? Okay, I think we have this on. And where is the HDMI cable that you want me to plug in? No, I, uh, it's connected. Is it that? No, this is power. It 
was muted all this while. I don't know what happened all of a sudden. <laughs> okay. Um, so how do I bring them? Uh, Here you go. I think Are you connected? I should be okay. Here you go. Okay, I'm sorry. I come back there again. Just, yeah. I'll just invite those people. Do you want me to still present? Still? Uh, yeah, you can present, but you don't have to be here, I think. OK. OK, good. I think I'm connected. Oof. I'm not sure I am. OK, the HDMI is with you, OK. So uh, you need to get RF in. That's his first thing. Yeah, I can see you. Uh, yeah. Or maybe Deb also, because I think he, he has something right in the beginning. Okay, so what will first RF? RF and Deb. RF? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Arif, you have to pick up, you have to accept the invitation. Okay, and then Deb. Okay, Deb, you have to accept the invitation. Yeah, uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, yes. Hey, okay, Arif, you're on. Uh, but let's get the slides. Uh, this you? is like Pedro has to present GitHub Actions. Uh, if you want to share your screen and share the slides from there, that's, it would, that would work as well. Okay, sure. Right? Sorry, we're having a lot of technical difficulties here. Yeah, uh, just, just share your screen. Okay. Share your screen. Sure. Can you uh, share your screen? Yeah, I'm sharing uh, it. That's all. It's fine. Okay. Uh, but I think Dave's slides are before me, so should I? Yeah. I think okay. Dave has to share first because his slides what are before me. It's my. Oh, it's it's Pedro. Okay. Go ahead, Pedro. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. All right. Hello. I'm gonna start. So, uh, since early on, we started um, with GitHub Actions in our development. So we have actions that run check patch. Uh, the, they do builds on GCC and Clang for 32 and 64 bit, run sparse and run Clang static analyzer. And we had a, a lot of success with those actions. So for instance, we caught a few bugs um, in the PR phase. We also, since early on, we are making sure that every commit is buildable. And of course we are taking care of those issues like spelling mistakes and things like that. Uh, 
Okay. The next uh, is uh, RF on P4. Yeah, P4 TC. Uh, I am not sure why I can't do. Okay, here. I think I can, but. Uh, I think this is Dave's uh, slide. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Anjali and others, uh, am I audible? Yep. Hey, everyone. So uh, we are talking about the backbone of this uh, P4TC work that uh, we are doing, and which is the the continuous integration part of it. So, uh, Deb, can uh, you be a little louder? <clears throat> so, we are talking about the backbone of this P4TC work, which is the uh, CI CD pipeline. And uh, it's uh, very important, uh, particularly for this work, because we have uh, developers literally all over the world, and uh, we need to detect the break-in in any code relatively quickly so that uh, it does not stall the developers from other sites. So we uh, use the GitHub pull requests, the GitHub PRs as uh, kind of the gateway to trigger this uh, CI-CD framework. Uh, Jenkins receives GitHub PR notifications through webhooks, which uh, triggers the GitHub pull request. And the uh, unit test uh, integration for which the TDC, uh, the Python kernel unit test uh, framework is used, uh, those jobs run on the Jenkins stages. So each job runs in a dedicated machine. It clones the P4TC kernel repo, the IP route to repos, and it invokes a script with uh, the unit test as an argument. And uh, this is the command line. Uh, as you can see, there are two rows of result uh, shown here. The first one, which uh, takes less time, is the average case, how, how much time it takes to, to clean the workspace, uh, clone the repo, clone the, uh, clone the two different repos, build it, run the test, and uh, perform any kind of post action. And the other row is uh, essentially the first one, which goes through some additional amount of uh, cleanup uh, that, that takes a little bit longer. So that's the result. And uh, you see the breakdowns in terms of uh, uh, milliseconds and seconds of how much time it takes to, to do the different steps. There is a simple diagram on the next slide. Uh, Anjali, can you go to that one? So that's the uh, topology. The code is on GitHub. Uh, the pull requests come, and uh, the automatic build is triggered, and uh, the teams are notified on the success fail. It's uh, fairly simple. But as you all know, it's uh, one of the critical factors of success for any open source development. So we are glad that we have got this uh, up and running uh, early enough. I think that's all I wanted to say about the CI/CD flow. Any questions? Oh, these are the number of tests in that uh, unit test framework that I talked about. As of now, we have uh, 376 tests, which uh, for which we use the TC's JSON output to verify. And we have been adding tests continuously. Uh, regarding the overall uh, CI CD itself, I just want to say that currently the focus is on the CI part of it, which is continuous integration, but the continuous deployment part of it, which is you know automatically be able to produce uh, release notes and other collaterals, uh, these are all uh, work in progress, but we, we hope to be there fairly soon.
I, I think it's Arif. Uh, he's going to talk about the V4 DC yeah. first. Uh, hello, am I uh, audible? Yeah. OK. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I will be talking about this P4 TC fuzzy, fuzzy testing uh, using Syscaller. So I think Syscaller, everyone knows, like it is a, a software framework to actually uh, do the fuzzy testing of the Linux kernel. And we are actually, uh, we added the template for P4 TC. The Sys, there are other fuzzes also, but Syscaller is like, uh, it, it is template driven and it is like coverage driven. So that is the uniqueness uh, like coverage driven part and we are uh, we are able to go deep into the code using the templates uh, uh, that we define so here i will uh, talk about the template that we have added uh, for p4tc so p4tc like uh, the main objects that we are uh, trying to test is like uh, pipeline action table class table instance table entry so you can see like uh, the system call so syscaller, like we have to tell the system call which we are going to use for first the kernel. So we are using like uh, uh, send message system call. Uh, so you can see that uh, send message system call has three arguments. Uh, first is socket FD. So this socket is NL route uh, socket. Uh, so we actually uh, create uh, this socket using socket system call, and the family is uh, like NL route and uh, the second argument is like the message and the message is like uh, it will encapsulate the uh, the networking messages uh, i will come to the next slide uh, describing this message so here as part of the syscaller, uh, syscaller we have to define the uh, we create a txt file and which is like uh, uh, which uh, we write uh, using the syntax of the syscaller so there is actually syntax to write the template so we added a new file socket netlink route before get txt and uh, the main thing is like uh, from the uh, very beginning we are running this scholar for whatever like uh, the code uh, developers are adding like at the same time we are running this scholar continuously like 24 by 7 and and uh, like uh, fixing the bugs also in parallel so like mostly this is helping in uh, uncovering like corner cases like uh, use of free and memory leaks and these stack over like kind of bugs which are not uh, which uh, which uh, we we are not able to catch with the unit test or which are difficult to catch with the unit test and also we are actually trying to integrate with ci cd so uh, then every pull request we will trigger this uh, so uh, there is a config file actually uh, that is input to the scholar so there we define that which system call we are uh, uh, are going to be used for fuzzy so mm -hmm. send message and socket socket actually gives the empty so uh, which is using to the send message. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so this is like a little bit uh, congested slide, but like uh, we are trying to capture the TXT some part. So because it's a big TXT file, so we only captured the main part of it. And on the right side, we are describing that uh, how uh, the main thing is like uh, we have to create a netlink message. So the netlink message format, if you see on the right side, like it has like header then IP service template and IP service specific TLVs. So uh, so on the left side, uh, you can see like line number 12 and 14. So uh, like 12 will create a socket uh, of uh, uh, AF Netlink uh, uh, family and like Netlink route protocol. And that socket uh, FD is passed to the, uh, the send message. And the second argument, like uh, uh, that message uh, pointer. So message uh, netlink uh, uh, we are uh, using like that is uh, uh, from syscaller so netlink messing route before schedule uh, that we are defining like uh, between line number 16 to 27 so that is like uh, uh, the logic actually that uh, uh, that generates the netlink messages so so we have like uh, um, we, uh, as in the last slide i told that five objects so you can see like uh, we are uh, uh, we are uh, having this, uh, uh, the second argument that P4TC message. So we had like P4TC object pipeline. And uh, the the, uh, the third argument is like uh, the before, this will create the TLVs. So uh, so this is like, uh, uh, if I, uh, so, uh, so you can see like the first one is the header. So header is like uh, create uh, and delete. So we, are, uh, we added like this, uh, uh, rtm underscore create before template this netlink header so and delete before template 
So this we are using as header for like all the four objects uh, like pipeline, table class, table instance, and uh, action. And then table entry we have. You're not connected, wired. For me, I'm still connected. Uh, You're still, you're still yeah, connected. Yeah, I'm still connected. Uh, can you move the slide to see if you're connected still? Yeah. Okay, you're connected. Uh, Arif, you're still there? Hello, I Yeah. Yeah. So that is a type uh, defined in line number uh, 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 35 to 38. So you can see like, uh, so it is, so we have like two types of attribute, like uh, we say uh, nested attribute or NL attribute side. So when we say nested, so it will be like expanded further and uh, there is a nesting happens. So on the right side, uh, so if you see uh, that uh, when, where is the nesting start in the IP service uh, specific data TLVs. So for example, like uh, we will have like TLV1, like max rules, then TLV2, number of classes, then pre-actions and post-actions. So I, uh, I'm not going to the uh, very deep details of what is pre-action, post-action and how it is like. Uh, so uh, the, the main thing to understand from this slide is like uh, that how the NL message are being formatted uh, using this PST file. So. Uh, which will actually uh, it will actually then uh, you can see uh, the the main thing is like uh, we can uh, uh, for for example uh, we can restrict the uh, line number 20 Arif we'll have to go a little faster i think because we're short on time yeah go to the next slide so here's like uh, so these are the crash uh, we have uh, uh, list of the crashes that we have uncovered, like uh, null pointer and stack out of bounds and use of the free and general protection fault memory leak. So it's, uh, some of these we have fixed, like there is null pointer we have fixed, like stack out of bounds we are able to root cause and use of the free. And uh, so if you go to the next slide, uh, I can just cover like two of this. So yeah, this is the last slide. So uh, you can see that uh, uh, use of the free bug. Uh, in the right side, uh, we have a backtrace. So it says a use after free uh, crash uh, in which like uh, pipeline find name and str and CMP is crashing. So uh, pipeline find uh, find name is trying to actually find the pipeline while while traversing the pipeline it is crashing. So so uh, pipeline pointer is actually uh, uh, is a dangling pointer which is trying to access. So on the left side you can see that how it has happened that. Uh, in line number 119, the first uh, uh, bracket that uh, when we are uh, allocating the pipe ID, uh, so we are populating this common dot PID, and uh, when there is an error path uh, I, uh, in line number 278, ID underscore RM, we are removing using the pipe ID. So we are allocating the common PID, but removing the pipe ID. So like uh, this is like only on the error condition it is coming here. And after that, the pipeline data structure is freed. And then when it is accessed uh, later on, uh, when we are traversing, so this is like uh, uh, IDR is the kernel ID allocated data structure. So it is using radix tree. So, so when it actually travels at the time, like uh, pipeline dang pointers find crashes. So, uh, so like, yeah, the fix is in line number 279. And another like uh, stack out of bound. So uh, okay, I will. I'm not go, uh, going to uh, go in the detail. It is just like a memory copy which is happening uh, using an index, and like uh, it is overflowing the stack. So uh, so we are able to actually find this uh, using this sys for the. So yeah, so it is helping us to find the corner cases, and we are uh, we are using syspro utility to actually regenerate the crash uh, using a C program. So yeah, so it is very helpful in uh, yeah debug. I mean, finding the. Uh, uh, difficult to find uh, kernel crashes. Thanks. Thanks, Arif. Any questions? Yeah, yeah I think we don't have uh, time, so we're going to run through some of this. So uh, this is the control path performance. Uh, Jamal, do you remember who was going to talk? Is it Satya? Is, is, he, is he in? Can he talk? Uh, oh, 
add the Satya, he is there online. Yeah, right there, right there. S A T H. Yep. Yep. Okay, Satya, to accept the. Satya, are you on? Yeah. Yes, yes, Anjali. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so till now, uh, uh, what we discussed is that uh, unit testing, regression testing, negative testing, and stability testing is covered, right? So we may need to verify the performance and evaluate the KPIs, like update rate, latency. So for uh, that is a reason. There is a utility called perf underscore app that was uh, developed by us. And it would be integrated with the CI/CD, and it can be executed at every pull request to catch the deviations on the uh, update rate or latency. Uh, so, uh, as of today, this PerfQ app it will it will uh, 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 address two uh, KPIs, performance values. One is update rate. Second is the latency. So, update rate is uh, it is like the rate of the uh, uh, entries it can be updated in the table like how many number of entries it is updating in the p4 uh, table at one second at every second okay so we, here we are using two methods to calculate the uh, update rate one is a synchronous method second is asynchronous method synchronous in the sense it sends the configuration request to the kernel and it waits for the successful or unsuccessful acknowledgement and then the second method is asynchronous method. So in this case, it is just reverse. It will not wait for the acknowledgement. And the performance also slightly higher than the synchronous that we'll discuss in the next slide. So uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, Anjali, can you please uh, go to that? Uh, yeah. So that, that's syntax performance per underscore app. The first slide is the uh, KPA name. Second, uh, second parameter is the batch. So that means batch 16 with default value. That means 16 table entries, it can be updated in one netlink message. So that is the best configuration. And third parameter is the method of uh, calculation, sync or async. By default, it is a sync asynchronous mode, and by passing sync as a parameter, it will uh, evaluate in the synchronous mode. And the second KPI is the latency. Latency is like it tells how many number of uh, oh, sorry, what is the how many how many nanoseconds it will take to add one entry. And then uh, same syntax latency, and then the batch size as we discussed how many number of entries, and then the third parameter is the synchronous or asynchronous. So it supports two modes, debug mode and non-debug mode. Debug mode, it will dump all the values in a file for the debugging purpose. And the non-debug mode, it will just take the average of the latencies of 60K rules and dump on the uh, terminal. And to improve the accuracy of the these KPIs, uh, we are pre we are not using the IP route to, uh, to avoid the fork and uh, uh, other latencies. And it will preload the netlink messages and it will send it to the kernel. Uh, so, so that it becomes uh, the build uh, message build latencies would not be there in the uh, performance evaluation. So, uh, Anjali, can you please move to the next slide, please? Okay. Uh, this in this slide we are talking about how we are evaluating the uh, uh, performance and what are the results. So, now to uh, to evaluate the update rate, what we need to we should be able to uh, load the in entries on the kernel uh, for n number of seconds so that means we should be able to make the kernel busy to uh, for n number of seconds so with one table we cannot do that so that's why we are adding one pipeline and then one table class and 32 table instances and each table instance we are adding 60k rules by changing the key on every rule so that it will create the uh, unique rule and uh, we are changing the batch size also. We calculated the uh, performance with each batch size. And uh, the uh, uh, result is like this. Observations are like this. Obviously, asynchronous mode having good performance than the synchronous mode. Uh, because in the synchronous mode, kernel would be busy and it will process more. And uh, uh, it, it will not send the uh, acknowledgement also. And that is for the lower batch stages. Uh, approximately for the lower batch stages, asynchronous mode have 30% greater performance than the synchronous mode. 
and then the batch size so uh, uh, throughput is directly proportional to the batch size when the batch size is increasing uh, the throughput also increasing and as per our observations batch size 16 is the optimal configuration value at that point we see the good performance and uh, asynchronous and asynchronous they are almost the same and uh, asynchronous is higher in the order of uh, thousands so batch size 16 is the best configuration and as of today uh, uh, the results are uh, uh, we are trying to improve the accuracy uh, um, optimizations in progress reviews are in progress and uh, uh, so we expect to publish the results shortly yes thanks thanks for the opportunity thanks Satya. so next is the test gen uh, bala yeah bala and so shuta i think you have to add both of them yeah i think so shuta is so Shuta. Yeah, sure. Because I know there's compiler stuff. So Shuta, you're presenting? Okay. So Shuta, can you um, hear us? We're waiting for So Shuta. It's very important to note that we do a lot of testing. That's what this is. From the moment a patch goes in to the moment uh, CICD kicks in, fuzz, fuzzy testing, fuzz, Cisco is running 24 hours a day in the back, right? And there'll be no opportunity to fix spelling mistakes we will, uh, or coding mistakes. Check patch is running every, every commit, spelling checker. <laughs> I don't remember the guy's name, but the guy who's maestro, Joe. We're making Joe patches very happy. We'll never hear from him, right? So when we upstream the patches, there will be a lot, there'll be better reviews, basically. Sorry, so so it's ready. So uh, I think it's Bala, not social. Bala. Yeah, sorry. That's what I thought. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll, bring, we'll bring up Bala. Bala is basically uh, also not just, we're not only not uh, testing the control data part. Huh? Your, your mic, mic is not on. Oh, okay. That is the same. That's the correct file, right? Yeah. I think you should leave. Okay, exactly. Bala, you... is going to talk about testing packet data as well. Yeah, I'm trying to see if there's. Yeah, Bala, you're invited. You should be able to talk. Okay, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Yeah, can you go to next slide, Anjali? Okay. Uh, P4 test gen is an offline tool that uses uh, symbolic execution to automatically generate uh, input out uh, packet test for a given P4 program. And P4 test gen uh, primarily attempts to generate uh, a set of tests of all reachable paths within the P4 program. And each test consists of an input packet and the control plane commands to populate uh, the P4 match action tables. And it also generates a predicate on the output packet. And each generated test also has a human readable trace that indicates the path through the program being exercised by that particular test. And since a P4 program path and branch can lead to, you know, uh, billions of path for the packet to, you know, go through, there is an option provided in the tool to control how many tests that you want to generate. Uh, it's basically just a numeric number. So if you want to generate a 10,000 test, it can uh, internally you know, apply some heuristic to optimally generate uh, you know, 10,000 test cases, which pretty much covers you know, the uh, most uh, you know, uh, preferred you know, packet paths. 
and this is uh, you know already available in the uh, p4 lang uh, p4c repo so the link is given here if you go to uh, p4c uh, repository you can see the uh, p4 test gen under the p4 tools as part of the compiler backend repo next slide So this is how we plan to automate uh, you know, the complete uh, uh, testing flow using P4 test gen. So given a P4 program, uh, you uh, compile that program using the respective backend compiler. Here, the P4TC uh, compiler, which confirms with PNA architecture. And you give the same P4 to the P4TC test gen utility. Uh, the compiler will generate P4TC templates, which is basically the four different templates that uh, Jamal talked about, which will be, uh, you know, uh, consulted by kernel for actual you know, packet processing. Whereas test gen will generate uh, the actual you know, packet stream along with that uh, the TC filter command. So using this, uh, it, it, it also generates the expected packet after. Uh, that particular packet you know, where goes through the kernel and uh, both the expected packet and the actual packet uh, will be compared to decide whether uh, you know the packet went through the expected uh, path or uh, you know, unexpected path. So depending on that, the automated comparison framework will mark it as uh, either in a success or fail. So that's how you know, uh, bug can be filed on the bug database. So this end-to-end -end flow is fully you know, automated. So currently, both the compiler and the test gen utility for TC is in uh, work in progress. So we plan to uh, upstream this into the P4 land uh, in the month of uh, uh, March 2023. That's. OK, so that was Balas. I think next agenda is. Uh, are we talking the who's next? Okay, so is it us? You mean it's the code, right? Yeah, okay. code walkthrough. All right. So any questions on the testing? Just we don't have time, but was there any specific questions? You see how we do all the massive testing in the background. Intel has a lot of hardware, so we in parallel, twenty-four hours a day, syscaller, TDC tests. Uh, the packet gen is work in progress, but that's where we're going as well, depending on the P4 program. Tom, hello. So, she, she needs to stop sharing. Are you sure? Uh, I need to get off that sharing. Okay, here you go. Okay. Okay. We can do that. No, better not. Sorry. Okay. He's going to show the IPROP 2 and the pieces of IPROP 2 and the kernel code. We don't have much time, so we need to give some time back to Anjali. 
Okay, so, so Victor is going to show bits and pieces of the code. If you have any questions, you can, you want something more detailed, he can show it after, or he can, you can ask him. And we need to give some uh, time back to Anjali. Because Anjali says, I, I caused the delay, Anjali. <laughs> It's just a joke. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, I, I don't have much to talk. Uh, yeah. You know, what's that? Oh, yeah, uh, I'll give you the link shortly. Yes, it's on GitHub. Right, we just released it actually during the talk, but it's not upstream. We we still have ways to go for upstream. We will do several reiterations, but it's going to be public. Okay. He's going to talk about it. Okay. Uh, do you want me to go with your stats? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so there's the diffs for the kernel code. You can see there's a bunch of them that have nothing to do with kernel code. Or you, is that the beginning? Okay, yeah, so there's some GitHub stuff that's for build for running check patch and other things. We also compile on different architectures, 32 bit, and we found some issues when compiling the 32 bits. Moment code gets committed. 64-bit and 32-bit, that's the only thing GitHub allows us to do. We've recently acquired an ARM process as well, so we're going to be building on ARM. Uh, the changes are not that much. Do you have the stats where it shows how many lines of code? OK, just maybe share that. And and then you can show the changes. Fonts too small, I can't see that. No, no, this is the wrong file. Yeah. All right, just just there. Go all the way to the end. Is this the one you're showing me earlier today? Yeah, I think we No, didn't you have it saved into some text file? Yeah, that was Roughly, we've got, uh, for the kernel code, we have over so close to 60% of it is just test cases. 40% okay? is kernel code, of which there's about 5 to 6% to core kernel code. So it's very clean, standalone. 5, maybe 6% of it is touching this uh, TC code. Uh, 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 the rest is just standalone, TC classify, etc., which can be compiled out if you don't want it. Uh, in fact, there's some enhancements to the kernel code. Uh, that we added, like you know, we we improved, for example, the action code to use IDRs instead of just uh, indices. Uh, we've th there's quite, there's a few bunch of actions that uh, of things that we've improved. Uh, so, sixty percent is just test cases of the code. It's about how many lines of code in total? Eighteen thousand. Eighteen thousand of which five percent is. But 200 lines, I think, was uh, or less was core API changes, not changes, but enhancements. And some are, you know, when you add a URP, that counts as core code, I guess. Yeah. You, you know, sometimes you have to edit packet cls.h, things of that sort. Uh, and in addition, um, about 17,000 lines of code in total. 18,000 is ours. Right, 18,000 is ours, of which 200. And one, or uh, no, plus two hundred and one. Plus two hundred and one. Oh, yeah. So that's that's the IP route, uh, the kernel code. Maybe you want to show some Git commits, and yeah. we also conform to writing novels, mini novels in the commits. So <laughs> we're good citizens. Uh, as an example, maybe show the pipeline, the Meta Act. See, look at that. Look at that. Beautiful. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, and we are using as part of because we do have bug fixes, etc. So some of the techniques we use, I didn't come up with this. I want to do things my way, but these guys here want to use the GitHub approach of things. Okay, which I, I, I don't like it very much, but I, I, I'd rather follow the the kernel process. So you see some patches which says fixes, as an example. And I think you're showing the wrong code too. No, this is Capital fixes. Right, capitals. Where? Okay, so you, you see things like this where it's something went wrong, right? And we add a patch. 
after because we keep moving to trees so we in terms of merging we look at the fixes and we come up with a proper commit and a proper so it helps in merging basically that fixes that commit therefore sort of what the um, stable guys do right you when you say fixes and you give the SHA key the SHA for the commit uh what else am i missing okay i'll hand it over to you now there's also that no, we can talk about that as well. So, baby, you wanted, yeah, Jamal. I think he wanted to show the. You guys are curious about something. The, um, I don't know the the table stuff. You want me to show them the table stuff? I don't know what, what do people want to see. <laughs> <laughs> Because we have to agree on the driver interfaces, right? Sorry, so there is no driver that exists. But stay tuned because it's part of this discussion, right? This is just what we have today. Uh, this is only the software. Uh, yes, from both kernel and IP route two. Yeah, so we'll show example of the network. I think uh, Jamal did show the examples of Netlink messages that will yeah. come down. Yeah. Uh, the end ops are not defined oh, yet. Think, We're going to define it. Yeah, maybe he wants to see like you running a command. Is that what you're asking? Oh, Do you want to see like a simple program or? Oh, code. Oh, uh, which code do you want to see? OK. Yeah, how much time do I we still have? Uh, you can still take time, 10 okay. minutes, yeah. So entry point. <laughs> it's just standard no, no. code, it's standard no, no. code, he, man. There's nothing about magical it. about it. You enter there and then you go through one thing. That's for. He, he's talking about the user space, TC commands that you put in. You want to see the code or you want to see how it's used? No, no, it's like, no, it's the kernel code, yeah, this is the kernel code. This is for updating what? A it's table. A table. Or updating a table. Right, so you, what you're seeing, for example, here, oh, I can't do that, right? But this is the uh, netlink message, rtm create, I don't know why we're calling it rtm, create p4 table entry, okay? And then that could be a create or an update, maybe go to that code, okay? Uh, and that comes with netlink attributes, we parse them, Nothing very exciting here, but okay. Uh, <laughs> and we have the net, uh, next X axe. Others you get the program name. That's what P name is. Then you call the TCCTL uh, P4 table uh, N. You go there maybe. Okay. And then you just massage through it, build your grab your attributes, that's all this is doing. Verify that they're correct, they're of the right type, etc. And then eventually you end up in updating or COU means create or update. And at some point you end up into, now you're gonna create an entry, you validated your parameters are looking good. So you enter this code and you're still parsing, I'm sorry, attributes. Now you're getting the... Now I got the table, the pipeline, the table class, the table instance. I don't know if you guys understood, but in, in P4, you have a pipeline which can have uh, tables, right? And each table in our abstraction has table instance, which is a subdivisions of a table, right? You can have like the first, first 10 rows having being a part of one instance and the next 20 rows or something being part of another instance. So here we get the, the pipeline, the table uh, object and the table instance object. We get the priority as well. If this is a, if this is an update, update, we need the priority of course, because we need to know which priority we want to update. Otherwise we go to the create we allocate a priority in the IDR uh, so that nobody can create another entry in the same priority. Uh, read some ref counts, allocate the entry, uh, copy the key, 
which is in this case, this is something useful to say, right, Jamal? The key, keys and masks of blob, they are. Sorry. So we, so the masks and the keys are just binary, depending on what the P4 program defines as a key. If it says the key is 64 bit, then user space just sends the blob of 32, 64 bits and the mask for it. And we just verify it and shove it into the table. Right. There's nothing, I don't know if this is exciting, but this code will be available like in, before this is over. Okay. So you can download it and then catch us on the hallways and we can answer any questions you have. Uh, maybe show the algorithmic Tika code. Is that of interest to you? Okay. Are you, are you picking on our coding style? Well, we can use case instead, maybe. <laughs> wait, 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 wait for the mailing list, man. Come on. <laughs> oh, oh, no, that, that's, uh, that's our Joe Peches thing, right? Dave Miller, okay, it has to be reverse. Okay, <laughs> Joe Peches doesn't like it, actually. I don't think he likes it. Oh, right, God. right. We're totally conforming. Hey, show him some reverse Christmas tree first. No, that's the Okay, here. There you go. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, if you want. But yeah, the table entry has a key. This TM here is the time uh, timestamps, like when it was created, when it was updated, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, priority mask ID, because as Jamal explained in the previous talk, we have a an IDR of masks or a list of masks, and this mask ID just tells us to which uh, mask this entry is related, what mask we use when we added it. That's what mask ID is here. Acts, which are actions that the user can associate with this table entry. So if you matched this specific entry, then execute this specific action. Could act here is because it could be more than one action. Uh, HT node, you guys are kernel guys, you know what this is. Uh, list, list member, RCU, uh, ref count, and uh, what Jamal likes to call the whodunit fields, which basically just say who created this table entry and who updated this table entry last. These are the. Sorry. So the question was, do you support LPM exact match? Yes, we support exact match LPM prefix. Uh, sorry, uh, tenary and range with one table implementation. We're so cool that we one uh, table implementation. You don't need 15 table types. Okay. I don't know. I think Anjali wants us out. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, can, do we continue? People want to hear about driver interface, and we also yeah, want to talk it, about the compiler So backend. don't slow us down, man. If you want to talk about driver interface, just cut it out here. OK. Uh, all right, maybe we give you back the time, Anjali. OK. We can run a demo, show you a simple P4 program. that We can show you that crazy calculator program. Or we can give you like a little demo of uh, adding an arbitrary P4 program that you know matches on something and then mirrors to something else. And it looks at the response and mirrors it somewhere else. But you know, pretty pedestrian. It's nothing very exciting. Just the fact that we that code, that, that data path did not exist in the kernel, and we created it, and then we show it works. And it should work with hardware offload. Do you have performance numbers? Not yet. We have performance numbers for the control path. We're testing, doing a lot. I don't know why they, Satya didn't show them, but we are doing about five, 600,000 per second on single entries, I think. But our goal is to, on a single core. We're not paralyzing anything. So. Our goal is, so the Netlink interface is designed from day one to be friendly to that, as opposed to when we flowers done, it's the issue was that was, you know, we used what was already there, right? So we structured the data structure so that this is working very fast from day one. Right. Unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss that. We give you back the time or? Yeah, okay. uh, you know, there is also the compiler backend stuff that, yeah, so okay. that I would like to present, sure, so I, I sure. would give it back to All her. Right. All right, thanks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah.
Mr. Well, if we have we, time, we'll come back to this. And yeah, of we, are, course, we are available. And you know, after 6 p.m., we'll take it to we wherever we're week. going. So Shruta, you, you're on? Hi everyone, can you hear me Anjali? Uh, so Shruta, the volume is very low, so. Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Hi everyone, so I'm going to talk about a topic for compiler backend for before TC. Next slide please. So before starting about the compiler backend, let me give an overview about the P4 and the P4 architecture. So uh, P4 is a high-level programming language that is used for programming the data plane of the network devices. So any P4 program uh, can be compiled and loaded to the target pipeline, provided there is a compiler for this uh, <coughs> target. So we already have open source front-end and mid-end, and uh, there are also open source backends available for different software targets like DPDK, ABPF. And, uh, any vendor uh, can extend <coughs> P4 support for the device by developing their own compiler by using the uh, front end and mid end, and they can develop their own back end and enable uh, P4 support for the hardware. So, normally a P4 program uh, consists of two uh, different parts one is an architecture part, and other one is an user program. So, this architecture file is also a P4 file. This normally you should uh, have uh, the structure and the pipelines that are present in this particular uh, target for which this compiler is being written. And uh, this actually serves as a contract between this user program and the target. And a P4 program, uh, user program, includes this architecture file as the base file and uh, defines what has to be done in each of these packet processing uh, pipeline uh, blocks that is given in this architecture file. For example, if the architecture has an, a parser and a control block, uh, the declaration will be present in an architecture file. And what has to be done in this parser block and uh, the control block, what type of parse graph has to be done is given in this parser uh, block and what control uh, tables and uh, Actions can be performed is given in the control block. Uh, this is how a normal P4 program will look like. So there are two standardized architecture that is provided by the P4 open source community. This is portable NIC architecture and portable switch architecture. Uh, PSA tries to cover the network interface card part and the PSA tries to cover the switch part. Anjali, next slide, please. So this is the workflow for the P4TC compiler. So uh, as I explained, uh, the compiler front end and mid end is uh, taken from the open source uh, community and uh, a normal compiler is uh, this compiler is taking P4 program and one more file called target or architecture constraints file and any uh, vendor uh, wants to develop uh, develop this hardware backend uh, separately. Now we are going to uh, develop TC backend for this P4TC and this P4TC generates two different uh, output one is p4tc template and introspection json gen, uh, output file so these two parts uh, can be loaded into the netlink and loaded into the kernel and runtime programming can be done i'll be talking about the p4tc template how it looks like uh, before that uh Anjali, next slide So what we are trying to do is for the initial version of the p4tc compiler we are going to support uh, pna architecture and uh, uh, this target or architecture constraint file, which is uh, being taken as an input by the compiler, is something that is going to have some constraints uh, that uh, that is that cannot be represented using the P4 constructor. If we have some constraint for the software target or the hardware target, these uh, constraints are given in this uh, file, and this will be consumed by the compiler along with the P4 program, and uh, the necessary <coughs> output will be generated based on these constraints. So here. Uh, in future, we are trying to support both PNA as well as PSA uh, architecture for the P4TC backend. Next slide. So yeah, normally this P4TC template script, which is outputted by the compiler, ha has uh, these four uh, sections: parser template, metadata template, and action template and pipeline template. This parser template section is used to represent the parse graph, which is uh, given in the parser. Uh, 
block of the P4, uh, which is actually representing the pass graph uh, uh, that, <clears throat> that uh, contains the headers that has to be pro uh, passed in the uh, given packet. Metadata, this section is used to represent the uh, structures or variables given in the P4, which is used to represent the intrinsic metadata or the packet metadata or the user-defined metadata given in the P4. Action template consists of different statements, uh, computational statements, assignment statements, which are used to uh, do some computations on the past headers as well as metadata. And this pipeline template, which is the overall, uh, representing the overall control and the order of the execution of the tables and the actions that are present in the P4. Next slide. So this is how the compiler works. Uh, it tries to map the P4 constructs to the P4TC template objects. You can see this parser block, which is present in the P4 <coughs> program, is mapped to this parser template section. Uh, metadata, which has structures or variables, uh, mapped to the metadata section of this P4TC template. Uh, P4 control block, which is going to have match action tables, uh, which are uh, which are going to be applied on the packets uh, coming. So these tables will have two uh, paths, keys and actions. Keys are uh, some packet, uh, meta packet fields or uh, metadata fields based on which uh, these actions have to be applied on the incoming packet. So this is mapped to T-class objects, keys object and action object in the P4TC. An apply block, which is having the logic, uh, the order of execution of the tables that are defined in the control, is actually mapped to the pre-actions and mapped using the pre-action and post-action template objects in the P4TC template. Next slide. So T class is actually an equivalent of the P4 table. As I explained, the key is the equivalent of the table keys from the P4. And this pre-actions and post-actions are actually uh, actions uh, that are present in both the t-class as well as pipeline template so when they are present in the t-class template they are going to represent uh, the sequence or the conditions under which the actions that are defined in this table has to be applied and when they are present in the pipeline template they are going to represent the sequence of conditions under which the tables have to be applied on the incoming packet the meta act which is given in different parts of this uh, template object is uh, something that is uh, allowing to do the programmatic computations on the uh, header fields intrinsic metadata the keys and the user defined metadata so this is a code snippet before uh, code snippet and the corresponding templates that will be generated by the compiler uh, so the first is a simple action, which is uh, uh, calling drop action, which is calling the drop packet extern. And you can see the uh, on the right side, the corresponding action template that is generated. So first is the declaration. We are uh, declaring the uh, action drop. Um, so here you can see it is an action. The second part, which is example, is the P4 program. And the main control implementation is the P4 control under which this action is being defined. So the next part uh, where the actual action is uh, defined, um, here the call is to the uh, drop packet extern uh, in the PNA architecture, which is going to drop the packet. So the corresponding TC command kernel or drop is, call, uh, is uh, generated here using the meta act command. Now as a complex action uh, set in hop. Uh, so here you can see the corresponding uh, template declaration and definition on the right side. Um, here you can see the computational operations like set, decrement uh, on the right side, uh, <clears throat> where uh, the assignment statement is uh, generated uh, by the, the for the assignment statement, the compiler generates the set statement and you can see the decrement instruction. And the last part, the send to port extern. So you can see the send to port extern in the PNA architecture is sending the packet to uh, the port that is given in this particular action. So for this, uh, the TC command kernel dot mirrored is being generated by the compiler. So this is how uh, the actions will be gen uh, for the actions before actions. The action templates will be generated. This is a simple example. Next slide. So this is a table and an apply block. So here, uh, similar to actions, we have T class for the table. So here you can see there are two keys. Uh, destination address and source address for which uh, we uh, have generated a keys template on the right side. <clears throat> So these keys are uh, <clears throat> passed from the using the parser. So that is given here. 
and uh, we have post action in this particular tick uh, tick class so depending upon uh, the execution the action has to be executed uh, either either the set and hop or the drop depending upon the uh, runtime value and you can see the command act uh, kernel dot drop which is the default action that will be executed if there is no uh, if there is no uh, hit for this particular entry then uh, the apply block the apply block for the apply block uh, uh, you can see the pipeline is being created uh, this is where uh, the actual pipeline is created and uh, you can see this <coughs> meta act which is saying uh, depending upon the direction when you say ist dot direction it is a packet which is coming from the net to the host so depending upon this the table has to be applied this is given using the uh, meta act command uh, branch equal uh, depending upon the direction and if the direction is zero which is nothing but net to host then the table simple match is applied if that is not there then nothing is being done for this particular apply logic so this is a uh, sample p4 and the p4c uh, snippet next Sorry, it is yeah. so. It is uh, this backend is uh, going through the kernel, and if you had a driver, the kernel will forward that to the driver, which then will run on your DPU or IPU, right? Yeah, but you know this is uh, you wrote a P4 program. The backend has created an equivalent uh, TC commands for you to kind of do both the pipeline creation first or, or the data plane creation. And then I think Jamal showed you the rule creation um, commands and stuff like that. This code is uh, publicly available? Uh, so Shruta, is this code now publicly av available? Uh, no, uh, no. So, uh, my okay. slide talks about it. Okay. Yeah, so, so she's going to talk. So we aim to add this TC backend? So we aim to add this TC backend as one of the open source backend along with DPTK ABPF uh, in the open source P4C repo. You can uh, see the folder structure of the repo where uh, it will be available. So <clears throat> you are planning to upstream once uh, we have a stabilized backend with a good number of testing and verification. And the plan is to upstream by uh, March 31st, 2023. Okay. So... That was the shooter, and uh, I think next is introspection. Um, just give me a second. Yeah, you need to add Neha. So did I hear that right? The ABPF is already considered a backend for this. Yes. Yeah. It's a soft backend. No, 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 back in. Well, no, not for the TP40TC, but in theory, you could just go with the EBPF route instead of going with the TC route for this. Correct. Yes. So, if you were totally running into the software, yes. Not seeing the full screen. Yeah. Nia, are you up? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, so, uh, Ajay, uh, Anjali, can I start presenting? Sure. Yeah. I, I can stop sharing. Go ahead. You can see my screen, right? Yep. Okay. So very quickly, I'll be flashing that what I'm going over. Uh, so in the first session, Jamal talked about this implementation, and Sufita talked about what the compiler is going to give. So May I'm going to talk about full screen uh, for the presentation. 
yeah i'm i'm going to go to a demo real quick so we're not going to stay here for long so um so right now what i'm going to talk about is this portion like whatever output compiler is expected to give uh, we just pack it into a tree of array type of data structure and pass it to the uh, code that jamal and his guys have worked on so right now uh, you you i think audience has a good understanding of uh, what neha could you increase the font size on the text um okay that's a little bit hard to do right now is it like not at all manageable no no not on the screen all right uh, let me let me come back give me one minute no it's of course not tc flower but then there are two options uh you can pipe the you know the data plane definition uh the same route that it is going into software in the kernel and then you forward that to the driver and driver programs it it's not very efficient for the hardware based on both the uh, intel and nvidia's finding so we believe a sideband uh interface like devlink to download the whole uh, compiled uh data uh you know the initial program is the is seems more uh, uh, optimal for this of course the runtime programming all goes through the software uh, from the kernel but just the compiled output for the initialization of the data plane we are still discussing that but it, part but it should be vendor specific or it should yeah, go so to the driver correct yes and 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 i we might end up there where you know the vendor may choose to kind of either implement it through devlink because that's the way they optimize their uh, binary blob that they download to the hardware or you know if if they think they won't take it in the script fashion you know add a table add a parse node whatever that is right you know in that order and you take it to the driver and you program it one thing at a time that's fine too i think yeah so um neha are you ready um okay um all right i'll 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 try do you want to just go through the slides instead of the code Yeah, because so is this better? Uh, this is my smaller screen. Yes. Yeah, this is better. Okay, but I have to keep switching between tabs, so bear with me, whoever requested. So. so i'm here to just walk you over a very simple demo i'm assuming people are not into p4 focused so i'm going to touch over the very basic stuff so usually for any p4 program like you can see this is the main but it is expected in a certain format so there is this parser there is this pre control there is this main control and e parser so in other languages think of like don't quote me on this but think of them like classes so we'll just for the purpose of this demo we are only going to focus on the main block uh, so this control is a keyword think of it like a class and this is the name of this control block okay and each control block inside the control block we specify few things so we'll first touch on the keyword table so this is a keyword table this is the name of the table and every table in p4 has a key and actions associated with it so for this table which we are calling as l3 match we are trying to do an exact match on dest ip and the actions that are supported in this program are send or drop so now send and drop are uh, specified on line number 53 
and 57. So this send to port and drop packet are the PNA specific X terms. So you just have to know that for now. And then this table has a size. So this is a hash define up in the program. And this is the default action. If nothing is specified, it's going to drop. So very simple program. We're doing an L3 match on the Rx and the action can be send or drop. And this, so this is just one table, but in your program, you can have many tables. So, so far, think of it like we have placed a block, multiple blocks on the whiteboard. But now with this apply keyword, we are stitching those blocks and forming a pipeline. So this logic can be as complex as you want. So for now, we are seeing if it's an Rx packet and it is invalid IPv4, then we call this special method called. So this is the name of the table, right? Here, this is the name of the table and we're applying that. So this is the program. Now, very quickly, I'm going to show you Uh, a sample output of how the compiler output will look like for this program. So Jamal and Sosutha, all those guys had talked about different scripts and templates, right? So the more uh, the uh, most important things that you have to take away is uh, this metadata struct in this JSON, this parser, table, keys, and the actions associated. So originally I had planned to have them side by side, but right now in the interest of time, if you guys remember, this was the name of the block. And then this is the name of the table. This is the size of the table. Key is again, just adder it's written here. This is the width. So key, keep, uh, keep this line in mind and stay with me. So we'll come back to this after I program the rules, but keep this in mind. And then this is the action. So we are going to program a send to port action. So this is how a JSON output would look like, okay? Neha, uh, you know, don't take more than like two, three minutes because we need to get to the driver. Yeah. So I'm going to quickly program the rule and do a get. So for the program that we talked about right now, so just focus on this and this. So here, uh, as part of our CRUD, we are doing a create here. And what are we trying to create? So this is the table. This is the table instance. This is the entry that we have added with a certain priority. And this is the action that we want. So everything is very similar to what we looked in our JSON and in our P4 program. And then we just do a get. So this is a sample output of the dump. So the part, uh, so this work is a contribution of many people. The part that I've specifically worked on is the introspection. Uh, but but many folks have worked on this and they can chime in. So that's uh, that's all from me. Anjali, I can stop sharing. Thanks a lot, Neha. Moff, essentially what, uh, while well, you're switching, uh, Angel, what uh, Neha was showing is the JSON file is the source of truth for us. All that name translation you saw with the IP addresses, basically we don't have any changes in IP route two. For every P4 program, there's one of those JSON files which is read and then there's a human layer. And in fact, what she didn't show, which in the future you could see, is you could keep hitting tab and getting out of completion for different types. and. You could put question marks and you get help and all that good stuff within IP route two, okay? Okay, so I think the uh, next topic is the driver interfaces and Khaled and I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, I'll take five minutes Khaled or maybe seven and then I'll hand it over to, to you and then uh, you can talk about the driver and if you have time for the parser, uh, Christian also if he has, we, we get to it. You know, we lost a lot of time, so. Okay, so let's get to this. Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so basically, this is a very, very abstract view of hopefully everybody kind of 
from the IPDP world can imagine what this is. So there is host on top. Uh, does it? Yes. Is it just too small or? <laughs> Come on. This is just, I'm going to just blow this up really big. Okay, let's see if this makes any difference in viewing. Okay, whatever. So uh, on top, orange is your host. In between is your IPDP. Uh, the bottom is your, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, tier one, tier two infrastructure um, uh, providers complex, uh, typically embedded cores. Uh, and you have your... Um, P4 controller shown in a small box sitting somewhere, which is trying to program the data plane, both the initial uh, data plane as well as the runtime rules. So what I'm showing here is that on the host side, you have lots of VMs, you have interfaces uh, in Teal, and on the bottom, you have your control plane driver most likely sitting in your infrastructure side, which is trying to program your hardware uh, for, um, uh, you know, your P4 data plane um, uh, packet processing. So typically, uh, you know, TC Flower or any other uh, TC U32 as well, I would think, uh, the model that has become very popular is the switch type model where your uh, driver exposes representers for your external ports and your internal ports. Um, that are there on the host side, uh, and and these uh, these are shown in those colorful little things at the bottom. Uh, you know, one corresponding with each of the external port on the IPU DPU, or and uh, you know, one of, uh, teal one for each of the uh, the VM interfaces and any other PF interfaces and whatnot. So, ideally, you put all these interfaces together. Um, into, uh, you know, if you were, your your data plane looked like the OVS data plane or something, you'll bind it to, um, you know, an OVS bridge. Um, when you create these uh, representers, you would also uh, create a block to kind of tie all these interfaces into one switching domain. Uh, and that's what is shown in yellow. And you have the uh, control plane driver that knows about this block in which all these interfaces are tied together and underneath you have a PCI device. Now, um, you know, if if this is, sorry, go ahead. Yep. Uh, I believe it's PF device, right? So I believe on the, on the host, it's a PF device. Yeah, yeah, there is PF and, and the VMs. the representers and... of the hardware, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. The so representers are, are on the the infrastructure complex, which is at the bottom blue. So TC commands of the driver will be implemented on the host, right? The TC commands are on the infrastructure complex because you are, you know, basically, this is more of the IPDPU world. And, and if you were running your control plane on the host side, like on a, on a smart NIC with, uh, without embedded cores or on an FNIC, then yes, this whole thing that I'm showing in the blue bottom would be in a VM or running on the hypervisor itself on the host, right? So I'm just showing it as a separate, uh, uh, you know, uh, embedded core because I'm fo focusing on the IPODP model. So in the IPODP model, definitely your control plane is sitting on your embedded core, which is running in Linux as well, as well as, you know, your host is running Linux and the VMs are running Linux or whatever else. Um, so, so that's what I'm showing here. So but, definite, but, but from the, from the user, uh, he want, he buys some smart NIC, right? It's plugging in the host. So he probably want to run this TC commands on the host, not on the, uh, well, it just depends on what kind of device it is. Uh, think, go ahead, Jamal. I, I think both, both models apply. I mean, depends. There's nothing that restricts us from one or the other. And she's talking about the IPU, where you'll have to do it in the complex. Right. But yeah, you know, it's it's an isolation of your control plane from your, you know, uh, tenant, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, code and all that stuff. It's easier for maintenance and uh, for hyperscalers. So that's how they partition. Nothing stops you from taking that blue and running inside a VM on host or on the host itself, right? If, if you didn't have embedded cores. But yeah, I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, logical partitioning that really has become popular in the IPUDP world. Um, yeah, asking. well, one quick thing though, is this is for the hardware only model. This wouldn't really apply to the TC Correct. because it wouldn't scale. Right, exactly. This, 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 is, this is focused on hardware offload and you know, how do you do hardware offload going from Linux kernel using TC before or before TC. Uh, okay, so so the thoughts here are that we have the switch dev and the representative model. One model could be that uh, you know um, you know you you can come in from the P4 compile uh, controller, and first thing the P4 controller that is remote is going to come in and try to uh, define your data plane, the P4 data plane, which is the output that Soshita was showing, which is a uh, the TC script. Um, uh, you know, that needs to be programmed one way or the other into the hardware. Now, we have a couple of choices. One choice is go directly using the P4TC route, which is, you know, Jamal's code, go into the driver, tell the driver, create a table, create a pipeline, all that stuff, create a parser, and one by one teach the hardware how to do it. The other route is you optimize that same P4 program generate a compiled output uh, with a different backend than the one that we were looking at, which is the TC backend output. You generate a backend uh, output for the given target, and that might be a binary blob, okay? And then you uh, send that through like something like DevLink, program the hardware. But the key here is the same P4 program has to be compiled for the TC backend for you to be able to run the runtime commands, right? You can't really, you know, just go and program the hardware and, you know, don't uh, have the backend for the TC uh, for, because the runtime has to go through the, uh, the P4TC. Uh, so, and in the runtime too, I mean, there are two categories and I'll just get to this very quickly. So, um, um, I, I actually want to go to this. Okay. so. There are a few different software hardware offload models. And I mean, of course, the model that Jamal has been focusing on is there's no offload. Everything is running in software. But of course, you know, he'll get paid from NVIDIA and Intel if he also makes it available for offload. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Jamal. But yeah, you know, so <laughs> yeah. But yeah, software is, is great. But yes, we need to get to the offload as well. So. Um, in the offload case, we could have a few different ways of looking at the offload. Uh, I don't show model one. Model one is what Jamal was presenting, which is complete software. But then he, he, he gets to model two and model three and model four. So what is model two? Model two could be that I can do 90% of all packet processing in the hardware, but there is something that hardware cannot do. And Jamal has to support that in software by saying, okay, you know, this P4 program, you know, table one to nine is going to be offloaded in the hardware. The 10th table is not offloaded in the hardware and it runs in software. So you come into the software, do the 10th table processing, and then the packet is delivered to whatever tenant or VM or container or whatever else, right? That's model two. Model three is that hardware does not have full capacity for each of the tables. So you replicate your model in hardware and software. When you go to program your rule uh, into your software, Software tries to program it on the hardware. Hardware says, oh, you know, this table is full. So that's when it sticks into the software. So this is a, it's the, the packet. Uh, so we'll look at the, what happens to the packet. But first of all, the model here is that I have exactly the same pipeline and software, exactly the same in hardware because there was a resource issue. I stick the rule in the hard, uh, in the software instead of the hardware. And now in this case, uh, you know, the P4 program has to be written in a way that you have the right escape path for, you know, the, you know, when you miss in the hardware table that it goes to the software and it runs through the software uh, tables, uh, you know, similar way. The, the fourth model is that you decided that, you know, 
there are some packets it's not worth handling in the hardware at all. Uh, I'll give you an example, uh, uh, fragmented packets. I really, really don't want to deal with it in my hardware because I need some memory and all that stuff and I want to you know, defrag it and then maybe run through my hardware pipeline. So right in the beginning, your you know parser in the hardware is going to say, okay, you know, just this kind of packet or these type of packets, you know, they are not going to go to the hardware uh, data plane. They punt it to the software, software takes it, uh, does whatever, you know, is described again in the PIFA program to deal with it. And, you know, it either re-injects it back to run through the hardware pipeline or it's like, okay, yeah, I took care of it. So there are a lo lot of different, you know, combinations that are possible with the hardware software models. Uh, of course, you know, ideally you would like that your hardware takes care of all of it and, you know, there is very little that software has to do, but there are cases that definitely we need the software model. So the point I'm making is the software model is not just for getting your ecosystem ready. At some point, it also solves some of the gaps that might be there in your domain specific architecture in the hardware. Uh, so there are two modes of programming. There is, uh, you know, uh, right now, most of the work that ha happened on the TC flower side, unfortunately, is based on this model where because either the hardware did not support multiple tables or you know the model was that there is cache in the hardware and there is uh, um, you know the the software um, basically runs through all the uh, policies decides what needs to happen to the packet and then programs a single table in the hardware and then you know it, it kind of collapses all the work that has to be done and uh, it is. It reacts to a first packet coming into the software, and then, based on that, the processing is decided. Then you could program the rule, and this works really well with the representer model. Um, you know, you take the first packet into the slow path. Although it's not very scalable, as we uh, realize when you get to billions of rules and the connection rate is really high, this causes a lot of jitter. So you know, a lot of cases, uh, you know, the modern pipelines are built to deal with uh, having no slow path or soft, you know, first packet missing into the software kind of idea. Everything is handled, handled in the hardware, which means that um, you just program policies upfront and based on that, the hardware itself creates the flow cache. So those are the two models. And, um, you know, I'm gonna stop here. If, this is like the example flow of what will happen, how you'll bind to your uh, uh, you know, driver, what would you uh, do to create your table entry and stuff like that? And then, you know, what does the NDO op that would go to the driver look like? It's really small, I guess. So you can't really see. Jamal wants to say something or no, 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 something? I'm just trying to make sure it's on. So because yes. we don't have much time. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So I'm, so this is, this is the flow that, uh, you know, we have talked about in the working group. I would really, uh, any of the vendors who are joining to kind of make this P4TC more, uh, you know, a community effort, uh, this is the time that, you know, we have started to talk about driver interface when Jamal has done a lot of good work in the software side already, so that we uh, now can kind of discuss about how we want to plug our driver to do the hardware offload. Okay, so uh, the, we, we all obviously have the option of sending NDO ops directly into the driver on the representer as we have talked about in the past. The only limitation there is whenever you program towards a representer and NDO op, you're saying, uh, you know, apply this rule only to this pack, the, the packets that are coming from this source. So it is, it is, you are implicitly adding one more field, which is like you're saying there's a source of the packet and you know this rule, even though I'm putting in a particular table, it only applies when the packet is coming from this source. Most of the time, the P4 program is not written that way. It's written more of like, you know, you have a block, any packet coming into a particular table, if it matches the criteria, the if conditions in the P4 program, it hits that table. And those conditions could be if it is a TCPIP, you know, packet, or if it is TCPIP and has this metadata, or whatever, then you hit this table. Um, when you hit that table, the rule applies to all packets hitting that table. And it might be like 
an L2 match, MAC address match. And based on that, you're doing a forwarding. So programming towards the representer really does not apply here. And, you know, so to me, the problem here is that we have to, uh, you know, be able to apply a rule to a table that is attached to a block, not towards the representer itself, because I'm not limiting it to a particular source. So that's the uh, issue that we need to address, and uh, I would give it to Khalid. Share, share the screen. Uh, hi all. Uh, I am Khaled uh, from NVIDIA. Uh, I, uh, I will continue the presentation of the compiler approach uh, and uh, I will uh, describe uh, some challenges uh, of each approach uh, that we have for the P4TC. So uh, basically, uh, as we saw, uh, we can combine uh, both the uh, target architectures uh, to have the, the final com compiler, if it's uh, the TC compiler with uh, the hardware uh, vendor specific uh, compiler uh, to reach uh, the final solution uh, that we have. And uh, so let's start with the different approach that we have. So we have three approaches. Uh, regarding the TC uh, compiler backend with the hardware vendor backend, if it uh, if we use it and how we use it, uh, let's uh, start with uh, the first one. So in this approach, in this approach, uh, we will compile our P4 uh, code program. Uh, to the, to the two uh, backend that we have using the hardware vendor compiler backend, we will compile it and uh, implement it uh, in th into the hardware. And in addition to that, we can compile it into the TC. And in this approach, we will not using the TC offload, but the TC will, will we will use it as a uh, backend for the expansions backend that the hardware cannot uh, handle. So in this approach, the positive thing that uh, because we have a hardware vendor compiler, we can compile the uh, P4 program uh, to the hardware uh, in the optimal way because we can optimize it according to the architecture that we have and according to the uh, accelerators that we already know that are exist in the, in the hardware itself. And that can also optimize the uh, TC software backend in different way. So we can implement the pipeline, the same pipeline in different ways in the hardware and different way in the software to optimize the implementation and gain uh, a better performance. Uh, the, main th uh, the main challenge here is actually a rule configuration because we need uh, to insert, when we need to insert uh, a rule to the tables, we need to insert it twice. We also uh, need to update the hardware implementation that we have, and also we the software. And we, we should maintain the two compilers, the hardware vendor and the TC, uh, TC1, and we should uh, verify that two implementation at the end will end up with the same behavior, okay? So the second approach is actually said the, the following. We will have the hardware vendor compiler backend, but we only will use it to configure uh, the tables that we have. We don't need, uh, we will not using, uh, we will not adding uh, our rules using, using the hardware vendor. That means the definition of the, uh, the tables that we have uh, in the program uh, will be implemented to the hardware using the hardware vendor implementation. And we will implement the same pipeline, the same tables that implemented in the hardware using the TC, and the root configuration uh, can be done only by uh, the TC uh, 
uh, backend because we already know that we have the same pipeline, the same table in both of them, right? So we can map the rules that we adding to the TC, to the software, to the hardware using uh, an offloads or using a driver, a network driver in the kernel. But uh, the challenge here is actually um, uh, also here we can use the TC as a, uh, as a software uh, backend, but uh, we cannot optimize it or because we need to, to have the same pipeline in both uh, implementation, also in the hardware and also in the software. So maybe also would be difficult to, to use uh, some accelerator in the hardware. Let's say that, for example, uh, we have LBM table in the, in the hardware in case you uh, you using it so in the tc the implementation will be uh, different you need to proc it i don't know for for example maybe to multiple hash tables so the challenge is to know how we, how we can optimize the software backend because it's the same as the hardware and we still have the per vendor backend uh, that we need to maintain uh, the, th the third approach is actually saying the following. Uh, we know that the TC is uh, having uh, an offload to some drivers, some vendors, right? So we will use the TC compiler with uh, almost a hardware agnostic. We will compile the P4 program using that. We will configure uh, the software. So we will have only a software backend, and uh, to to have the the hardware backend, we will use an offload for the match table and the parser and so on using the uh, regular uh, TC offload. So with this implementation, uh, we will have uh, we don't have the limit. Uh, we actually uh, have a hardware agnostic uh, backing at all. We don't need uh, a per uh, vendor compiler, and we uh, configure only one pipeline, offload it to the, to the hardware. But uh, the ch the main challenge here is actually how we can uh, optimize uh, the pipeline or optimize the offload, because. And the rest of the stack from the completion until the to the driver, we uh, almost uh, hardware agnostic. It's a regular TC in the kernel. We don't know which uh, vendor we are running on. So how we can determine uh, how ex uh, which accelerators can we use or defined in the hardware and uh, which optimization uh, can be performed uh, in the specific hardware. Uh, so after that, I, I will explain a little bit about the uh, the complexity of the optimization that uh, need to to make. So regarding the compiler optimization, so one of the major uh, jobs of the compiler beside to translate uh, the code from a high level code to something that can run on the hardware. Uh, is actually to perform optimization on the code uh, to, uh, to have a better performance. But the optimization is actually dependent uh, on the specific hardware that we are uh, running on because uh, different hardwares can have uh, different architectures and different architectures mean that maybe uh, uh, we need different optimization for each one of them. For example, we can uh, we uh, have in the in the switches two main uh, architectures uh, RMT and DRMT. I will explain in the next slide uh, the main difference between them, and I will give an example about optimization that not really can work on both of them, or we have to consider how to to perform it in each one of them. And also different hardware can have different uh, accelerators. For example, uh, some uh, hardware can have a TCAM uh, to accelerate the ternary match, while other will not, uh, it didn't have uh, uh, this accelerator. So when we're talking about uh, uh, a backend compiler uh, like a TC, when it's uh, when we talk about a hardware agnostic compiler it's difficult to optimize uh, the code in optimal way to different hardwares we need to know which layer have to to, to take a, a decision about this optimization if it's a driver because it's already uh, know which hardware is going to run on uh, uh, the code on 
or a different uh, layer. So here in the image, you can see uh, the uh, two architectures. Uh, the above one is uh, the uh, RMT, the reconfigurable uh, match table architectures. As you can see, the pipeline uh, here in this architecture is built from stages. Uh, each stage implement part of the pipeline. So if our pipeline is uh, building from uh, multiple tables, each stage can uh, match on specific table or multiple tables. And the bucket uh, will go over these stages until the end to perform all the all the pipeline. And each stage have its uh, each memory. So, for example, if in case we have a huge table, maybe we cannot insert it in uh, one stage. We may divide it in multiple stages. Uh, and the other approach is actually, uh, well, it's not a pipeline approach, but we will have uh, some pro uh, processors. Each processor uh, will uh, implement uh, the whole pipeline. So when we re, uh, when we uh, get a packet, we will assign it to, to uh, a specific processor. Will uh, perform the whole pipeline uh, until the end. But uh, in this approach, uh, the memory it's not part of the processor. The memory it's actually uh, all the processors have a shared memory, which uh, they access using crossbar. So for example, uh, for this uh, architectures is uh, important for us uh, the number of accessing the memory because the memory it's not in the processor itself but it's uh, it's uh, far so after we see the uh, two uh, two architectures let's take an example about a, a pipeline that we wanted to implement uh, on our hardware so the pipeline for example constant uh, from uh, fruit uh, three tables so on RMT architectures that, for example, have three stages, we determine that the optimal way to, to perform that it's um, actually to implement each table in different stage, and uh, using that we will perf uh, we will use the hardware in optimal way and will reach a better performance. While on DRMT, maybe we consider to merge the tables into one because it's important to us the number of look uh, lookups uh, that the process uh, uh, processor is used because it's uh, actually tell us how how ma how many uh, memory access we will have in our pipeline so as we see here for example different architectures are uh, considered to implement the merging in different way uh, for uh, one of them it's uh, considered uh, it to, uh, to work with it but for uh, other uh, other architecture is the it's uh, a wrong decision to, to make so also as, as I mentioned before, uh, some hardwares uh, will have uh, some accelerators uh, like uh, LBM uh, tables or uh, TCAM for ternary match. So it's difficult uh, to make advantage, uh, advantage of these accelerators or to use them if we have a hardware agnostic approach because uh, we need to know that with accel which accelerators are existed in specific hardware, and then we can use uh, them in our implementation. Uh, so that's it regarding uh, the compiler approach. Yeah, if you go back to the slide. Yeah, so in this, you know, the, the next one. Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, we've implemented an algorithmic TCAM software. So all the information, for example, for this information is all available. If you, yes, internally in the black box perspective, we're doing L hashing, but we set by algorithmic, we separated the masks from, from the key, then uh, we can give you this abstraction. So nothing is lost in the sense, right? Um, We can do LPM, we can do Tenery, we can do exact, we can do um, range. So, with this information, it's So, when you are talking about the, uh, that you can make LBM or uh, ternary match, you also have this type that, that you are, uh, is 
that you are performing LBM match, not uh, hash tables or how you implement it, right? From black box perspective, it looks like LPM, but internally the way we implement it. So yeah, it looks like an LPM. If you look at it from the top, it looks like an LPM. Inside, if you open the box, yeah, it may be using hash, right? But you, you don't get to see that. But you but the input is the same as, as uh, TCAM. Uh, you got key and mask. Uh, I see. So uh, as you say, as you see uh, that, uh, as you say, that means that you can pass this information using the offload to the driver that we are making ternary. Also, okay, okay, I got it. Yes, yes. So, uh, basically, uh, Khaled, uh, when you compile and say you're compiling for your target, the hardware, right? You would have. Um, generated some output. I'm just giving an example. You generate some output, you want to program it directly into the hardware, but you'll compile the same program for the software as well. When you compile it for the software, the TC backend that you have produced, you know, it is giving all the information that your driver needs. So if it wanted to create like say tables on the fly as well, it can actually do it because you, there's no information that was uh, lost from your P4 program and the JSON output of it. So it's everything is passed to the driver. Yeah, uh, uh, no, and uh, I, I agree with you, but in this, uh, in this slide, what I mentioned is actually when we talking about the uh, third approach, that means that we will not, we will have only the TC compiler backend without any information about the specific vendor that we are working with. Right, so this is the part of the discussion, right? So Jamal, we had talked about like, how do we give information to the driver about the, you know, the P4 info and P4 context stuff, which is a JSON file. And, and that's what gives the, the driver the information about like, how do I map this table onto my hardware? Yeah, so, right? the, so the question is, once, once you have the P4 program compiled, there's something that the driver needs to have and there's something that the kernel needs to have. Right. And they, they, they better be in sync, right? The same version, the same code, I mean, the same abstraction. So this is what the DevLink model would be, where you're loading to the driver through DevLink, and you're loading through NetLink for the software end right. of things. Exactly. And then no one... Specifically, what he's talking about here is this is just TC only. He's falling back to the deprecated, what would be deprecated support at this point. So what I would think you would end up needing is a separate backend or almost variants of the backend, kind of like what we have for CPUs and such. It says, okay, this is TC, but we want to optimize for TC on Mellanox because we have these hardware offloads we can use that we can't use with normal TC is what he's getting at. So I think what you'd end so, up with is having to deal with some sub variants within your given architectures that you're supporting for your backends. So I'm, I'm still not sure. So you, you, the abstraction is P4, right? P4 describes how the tables look like, how, what the actions are. Your hardware has to support them. I mean, there's a, the, the input into the compiler has to describe a constraint of what your hardware can do. Right. Right. Both the resource and yeah, you know, with the sizes uh, and what actions can be supported, those have to be fed into the compiler. And uh, what what am I missing? So basically, so so basically, what's missing here is he's doing TC, right. but he's doing TC on Mellanox with the offloads turned on. So this right. is offloaded. So basically, but, to but optimize Alex, for it, yeah. you're having to take advantage of the Mellanox specific optimizations. In this case, the extra hard hardware offloads. So it's almost. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I, I get your point. I, I will explain. Okay. Uh, okay. You are talking You are uh, talking about different approach. You are talking about this approach, that you have uh, the hardware vendor backend, right, with uh, that EC with some modification, right? Right where uh, when you compile using the TC backend, you will pass to the, C, uh, to the TC about the hardware limitation and the hardware capabilities, right? But what I described after that, it's actually different approach. That's uh, which the regular TC without any notification about the hardware that you have. So 
about uh, so uh, using this approach how, how you can uh, actually uh, pass uh, information specific according to the hardware so i only describe the three approach and the challenges of each one of them so the main challenge uh, for the th uh, third one that you don't have information about the specific hardware that you ca you have and then you cannot use all the accelerators that are uh, the hardware vendor is is uh, implement right yeah so Khaled, we we actually came up with a way to kind of do okay. uh, similar things and maybe we can take I, I this discussion have, outside because i think out. yeah the time is out it seems like we need another meeting we lost the 30 minutes yeah okay. yeah i think maybe we uh, can find some time tomorrow 30 minutes we'll, we'll, well, yeah i don't know i mean this week but uh, I, I feel i'm missing something are you intending to maintain the drivers is Melanox? sorry i keep saying Melanox. nvidia it's right? gonna compile the t4 to tc power so whatever it, we have today yeah. right jamal he's yeah, saying so that i didn't so the, 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 the accelerators are fixed they don't they can't be changed no uh, as you can see i the back end for your target has to be always written and your target is going to be different for the back end. Uh, as uh, the the main thing that i discuss here is actually three approach so the third one is uh, uh, that didn't uh, the compiler didn't have any information about the hardware ven uh, vendor so i don't say that i wanted to use this approach Right. Different, different, different thing about that. I, I say that uh, our compiler should have information about the hardware vendor, uh, the specific hardware vendor. So the main limitation about th the third approach is actually that uh, he's uh, it missing this information. Right. Right. He's not suggesting that. I, he's I saying, didn't he's saying suggest that, you know, that If you didn't put those constraints when you're compiling, mm -hmm. or your backend was not target aware, which is the hardware target, right. that you cannot really do the right thing for your hardware. If, if you just, you know, you didn't give any sideband JSON file or anything to your driver, it has no way of, you it's, know. It's, it's difficult to gain the best performance from your hardware because you don't have all the information about how things are implemented into it and which accelerators. And the mapping and stuff have. like that, right? Because right. We, we have logical blocks, exact match or, you know, a TCAM or, and then we make logical blocks out of it. So when you pass something, it's not the driver, it's actually the compiler which has already said, this table actually is mapped to this block. And so that is the information that is passed in the context JSON. I think we, we, need, we need to have another meeting. Yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah, we, we lost the 30 minutes initially. But right. And, yeah, and we, we, there's one more topic that we missed, which is about the parser. And I think Khalid and Christian both have material on it. So you think we can fit something later yeah, well, the week? Let's find some time. How long are you going to be at the conference? How long? What? Uh, are you going to be in the conference for how yeah, long? For, uh, yeah, okay. It's, it's okay, so. Okay. This thing goes very according to plan. Yeah, sorry, Christian. Like, we didn't get to the parser, so, but we'll find some time. I thought I ended it. Did I end it?